And it occurred to me during worship that one reason for that might be because we're supposed to see Jesus in each other. And if we have a picture in mind, maybe the person I'm looking at doesn't measure up to the picture. But maybe God wants me to see Jesus all around me. I believe that's true. And he is all around. I don't know if you've ever thought of it like this, but that you've never, you've never gone into a room that he wasn't in. Never. Never. He's always there. You don't always see him. You don't always feel him. But the gospel is always true when you go in that room, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing. If you're desperate, he's there, near, not far, willing, loving, caring for you, caring about your life, caring about the plan and the purpose for your life. And every one of you has a purpose. Every one of you has purpose in God. He, he sees you he sees you differently than you see you in the mirror, often. He, all the stuff fades away, and there's a plan. There's still a plan. There's still a hope. He sees your broken heart. If you've got a broken heart, many do. He sees the, the wounds and the stuff. He sees the failures and the bad choices. He knows all about all that stuff, and yet he's looking. Here is love still vast as the ocean, as we sang. Perfect love, unchanging love. Love is higher, love's deeper, love's wider. Out of Ephesians, it states it. What a great picture. For your sake and for the sake of those you live with, interact with, let's just take a minute right now and welcome his limitless love to be to us more than it's ever been before. Let's welcome the love of God. Let's host. Let's be willing. God, forgive us for when we fail to host you. When we fail to treat you like you're worthy of. The first, the high, the beginning, the end. The greatest lover of our souls that, that has ever been. You are, you're the one who framed life for us who called us with a purpose and made us for a purpose. And Lord, sometimes we miss the message. We miss the memos. We miss the interactions. You're in the room and we're not aware. We're not aware of your great love for us in that moment. Sometimes we've been terrified, deeply wounded, crushed, thought we would not recover, and you were there and you are able to heal and deliver and recover and turn it for gain, for glory to God and for praise in the earth to your great name. You're able to heal us to the uttermost. In Jesus' name, every wound, there's an answer for you in Jesus. Every sorrow, every heartbreak, every bondage, there's an answer in Jesus for you today. There's an answer. You are not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Yeshua is Lord. God has triumphed in Christ. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Lord, we welcome you. Would you receive that from the Holy Spirit, wind of the Holy Spirit, that reveals Jesus that draws us to the very, to be, take our place with him and him with us. God with us, us with God. God with us, God with this flawed gathering of people. God with the flawed people at home. God with all the flawed, because we all are apart from him. And God with all the righteous, because we all are. When we're in Jesus, we are. And somehow make those two things that are so seemingly far apart, make them one. In the name of Jesus, in your presence, Lord, is fullness of joy. I speak joy, not like the world gives. I speak life. The life in Jesus is full, full, full of joy. In the name of Jesus. Hmm. 
So in Jesus' name, if, if, you are, if you're a person, whatever, today you could say in some way you feel there's space between you and God. I just want to pray for you because I believe that he wants to shrink that space. So, and, and would you just step into that by putting your hand up if that's you? Just, just to God. It's really more to God than anything else. To God. God. And if it's not you in this moment, I'm telling you it was me this week. And it's been me plenty of times. The space I feel and the space I leave in the name of Jesus, it's not space you want there, God. Between us as a body with you and between, uh, and between us and you individually. I bless, I bless that you have called us and made us your own. Hear it today, my son. He's talking to you. My daughter, he's talking to you. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest, Jesus said. Jesus is still saying. I believe that's proceeding from the mouth of God right now to some of you. Maybe all of us. God knows that we need to live it and believe it more than we ever do. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and I'm humble of heart, Jesus said. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I do believe there's a healing atmosphere here for the heart. So I bless, I bless your heart. If, you're, if you know your heart's one of those hearts, put your hand on your heart. I do it a lot. I'm calling forth all that he wants from my heart. I call forth, I call it forth. I declare that God wants more for me than I partake of. God wants more for us than we partake of. Oh, let our hearts step into what you want to do, God. Not just in this moment. I do pray in this moment we'll step in. In this moment we'll be engaged. But God, that that will become our practice increasingly common for us in practice. that you laugh at our enemies, that we will laugh at them too. Because you are undoing everything he's done. And you are bringing forth the glory of God, God in us, these flawed vessels, in us who apart from you were not a whole lot of anything. But in our God, we are sons and daughters, priests, ambassadors, the body of Christ. I bless you, body of Christ, to live and move in him. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Wow, holy, 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 holy. Jesus speaks in the name of Jesus. My sheep know my voice. Declare it, it's yours. My sheep know my voice. Lord, we're listening. So in the next few minutes, if you would do this, because I believe God would use some of you right now to pray for one another or bless one another and just give a word of encouragement, something to one another. And if you've got nothing to say, say just maybe, maybe it's a faith declaration. Just say, awake, because there's more for you than, than you know, and, and God would love for you to have it. So just, just uh, take a couple minutes right now and just do a quick visit in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. Thank you, worship team. haven't gone to children's church they can go thank you god
so um, Jesus blessed you a bunch and thank you for being here. I just want to remind you two things. One is if you didn't hear it, Pastor Josh is preaching in uh, Boonville today. And, and I guess why I thought it was maybe good for me to underscore that is because I think, I think that when the lead pastor goes out to minister, I think you're giving somebody a gift. I think, and so, uh, and so I, I want us to, I want to encourage us to be engaged in the giving of the gift. And so we bless, we bless Pastor Josh and Becky as they minister in Boonville, and we thank you for life coming into them and life going out of them, and we uh, love that your blessing would be here and your blessing would be there in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And second thing is that on September 11th, I believe it's the 11th, that's a Wednesday night, we'll do one more um, uh, midweek better together, and I would in ask, if at all possible, for particularly for life group leaders to be present. I want to uh, give you just a quick opportunity in that meeting to uh, just uh, say something about the group that you're going to be doing this coming fall for people. So please... Um, and I will want to know if, if you're one of those people that is planning, would hope to start a group, please communicate with me like this week if possible. Email would be great to start with and uh, let's get moving because I believe there's going to be a bunch of groups and they're going to be great. In Jesus' name. So, <clears throat> Lord, you're breathing and life to us and speaking life to us and please... Let this be a part of that. So, several weeks ago, I mentioned that there's an un unfolding plan for my life. That's me. I think I was somewhere between 8 and 10. I don't, uh, I'm not positive about it. It's a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, and I said that's the truth, but it turns out it took a lot of persevering for for me to get to some of these places, and there's places I'm yet to go. And so I still feel like uh, very much that God's put in front of me, there's more for you. And so, um, but still, this is still true for me. So it's not just true for you, this is true for me. You have, I have, we have need of endurance so that when we have done the will of God, Lord, I'm doing what you told me to do and nothing's going right. It's not happening. Where is it that you may receive what is promised? And so, we talked about, and I want to go back to it, we talked about Joseph and the life of Joseph. And just to, because uh, we're not going to go all the way back to the beginning and everything, but just to Joseph in the Bible, not Joseph and Mary Joseph, but Joseph, son of Jacob. At the age of 17, he had a dream. Um, Joseph was a man who had, for all intents and purposes, he had four wives, all living together in this great community that became turned into the nation of Israel um, so, and that's a wild story and, and you can have questions about that but I'm not going to answer them all today <laughs> so but the wife that he always wanted is the mother of Joseph and of Benjamin and everybody knew it in the family and so at the age of 17 uh, Joseph has observed and feels a lot of animus coming from his brothers toward him. And yet God has a bigger plan for the family of Jacob or the family, the tribes of Israel, than who's on top and what's going on and everything. And so all this pushing and shoving that's gone on and all the tension that exists for a lot of reasons and he has a dream, and in that dream, he sees his brothers, through, through the picture in the dream, he sees his brothers bowing in front of him, and they deeply resent hearing it, and he apparently didn't mind telling him that dream. So whatever that means, I think, I think really, I think he needs work too, okay? But really, whether he knows it or not, there's a great deal of mystery because there's a lot of things he doesn't know. And can, can you agree that there's a lot of things you don't know? Like if God's going to accomplish his glory in your life, there's things you don't know. 
How is that ever going to happen? How could it happen? And even at this point in my life, there's mystery. There's still mystery, and there's still challenges. And, and so he, uh, he doesn't know the time and the place and everything. He doesn't know what kind of leadership it actually is. He doesn't know how long the leadership will last. He, does, he really doesn't know anything except he got a picture and he liked it. I will be a leader of this family. Okay, so, so he liked that picture. And really, he probably does not have the love that he needs for his family. I'm just going to say it that way. Is that okay to say it that way? So, so he was, he's glad to have them bow in front of him, but he might not really like, like, I'm here to serve you, my brothers. I don't know that he's ready to say, I'm here to serve you. I'm, I'm thinking he's liking the idea, I'm on top, you're on the bottom. I think he likes it. Well, a bunch of choices get made to get there. We, we make choices a lot. Today might not be a pivotal day in your life, but you're going to make a bunch of choices today, and some of them could affect your life significantly, even though today might not seem to you like a pivotal day. But it, it can happen. And all of this takes place in a world or in a, in a place where God sees everything and God actually really does want something great. He wants the glory of God in all of us. He wants us to fully partake of him. He wants us to move in him and live with him. And he wants to show himself to a bunch of people. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so... His brothers had captured him. He was, at, they, he was out looking for them in the field to, to uh, find out how they're doing and bring back a report to his dad, which is, you know, narking or whatever it is, and he tells on them and everything. And apparently they lacked some integrity because they did do things that needed to be told on, apparently. So it runs in their family. He has, they have a grandfather on their mother's side, or at least, um, yeah, for a lot of them, Laban is a grandfather, and Laban's a, a nasty, tricky, deceptive guy, and apparently it's visiting the family, moving along. And so they uh, beat him up, they throw him in a pit, they decide, figure out what they're going to do, and they decide that they're just going to, they talk about killing him, and Judah, by the way, um, seemed to be good with that. And among, they, they seem to be good with that in that conversation. And uh, they sell him to traders, and he winds up in Egypt. And, uh, and again, I'm going to try and move pretty quickly through there, through this, as I move forward from here. And I believe, I believe there is, for some of us, if not all of us, there is an application for this story. You need, you need some things from this story, I think. The Lord was with Joseph in the house of the Egyptians. So he's sold into slavery and he's sold to a, uh, he's referred to a number of things as the captain of the guard whatever that means. So it means he's got some standing. And apparently, we'll learn a little bit about him, but he's got a household that's got some problems in it, and particularly with a wife in that household, who is, uh, she's, she's trouble. So the Lord was with Joseph in the house of the Egyptian. And how does he know it? There's favor on his life. So I'm just holding out to you that some terrible things can happen in your life that do not conflict with the idea that God is with you. Okay? Take it in, because it's supposed to, you, we're supposed to take that all the way in to whatever's going on in our life, to pull it all the way in, and then, and then like, whatever's going on in my life, that I, particularly that's bothering me, uh, unsettling to me, not comfortable to me, I'm struggling with things, whatever that is. I'm supposed to take it right there and understand that God's favor can live here. Start with God's favor. Don't start with trying to change things. Start with his favor. 
And we understand that Joseph lives with integrity, but the master's wife has begun to proposition Joseph about them being intimate. And Joseph keeps avoiding her and shutting it down. But then one day, he's alone in the house with her. Could be a very big house, but he's alone in the house with her. And she grabs him and says, lie with me. I hope I don't have to explain that to you. And he wouldn't do it, and he escapes, but he doesn't escape. She holds on to his, his tunic, and his tunic comes off because she won't let it go, and he's running. Pretty quickly, she turns it, and she says, help, help. He tried to attack me. And for some reason, I, I can't, as I imagine the story, I can't imagine her being believable. I just, I, I can't, because I have to believe that this is no surprise to a bunch of people in that house, that this is, this is who this person is. But she's powerful. She's the wife of the master of the house. And maybe in some ways he knows. And he doesn't much care. He's turned everything over to Joseph. But they have to do something. They put him in prison. And if I think this is the case. It's called the prison of the captain of the guard. Well, he's the captain of the guard. So he puts him under, I think, he puts him under somebody. So he's in a prison. But he's in a place where he can still be a blessing to the captain of the guard. And pretty quickly, turns out the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, gave him favor with the keeper of the prison, who was under the captain of the guard. He was under the captain of the guard, but now he's in this prison, this some kind of prison, house, place, thing. And he committed to Joseph Joseph's hand, all the prisoners that were there. And the Lord was with him. I don't know how you do with the jobs you don't like doing. The dirty work, the difficult work, the challenging work, the work that it's not fair. But in all of it, we, we love the promise, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But what if it looks like that? But that's how you walk it through. That's how you do it. You actually have to meet God, meet the God who's already in the room. He's in the prison cell. He's in the prison house. He's already there, and he has favor for you, and it's manifest, but it's not doing what you'd like it to do, which is get me out of this place, but it's not doing it. To the point where he can look at other prisoners that are put in there, and he looks at these two guys that, that also worked for Pharaoh, a butler, the chief butler and the chief baker, and he says to them one day, why do you look so sad today? He cares for them. He sees them as under his care, and he's caring for them. He's being faithful. I believe he's walking in integrity. And by the way, I would suggest to you it's possible that there's no real integrity in the family that he came from, not a whole lot. It could be there. It should be there. But it's deeply lacking there. And Jacob's family... That's a problem. They had dreams. He tells them interpretations belong to God. And I suspect that he's able to hear the still small voice of God. These aren't his dreams. He listens to a dream and God speaks. He hears God. That's for us to hear God. That's for us to know God in all circumstances, in difficult circumstances. He has choices to make, and he's making great choices. He's loving. We've heard Pastor Josh preach it again last week. He's loving the person in front of him, apparently. God would like us to do that, too. He's in a prison. He didn't ask to be there. He didn't ask to go there. He's in the land. He didn't ask to go there. He's sent there, beat up, terrified, that through the situation that got him there and everything, and now he's being honorable. He's being faithful. He's serving, and God has not forgotten him. 
God has not forgotten you. Thirteen years go by. That's quite a while. He asked the guy to remember him. The guy does not remember him, the uh, chief butler. And two more years go by. So now it's 13 years since Joseph was put in that pit and sold as a slave. And Pharaoh has a dream. I've had a dream. There's no one who can interpret it. The butler says, I know a guy. He says to Joseph, can you interpret dreams? He said, I know a God who can. He'll tell me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And he does. And he tells him what he ought to do with the dream. The still small voice, he hears God. You could hear God. Still small voice. It's not all prophecy. It's not all just wow. But hearing God in your life can lead to a lot of wow. It can lead to changing everything. I'm, I've, I would love to hear like when I think about, look at this story, I would love to hear exactly Joseph describe, how'd that go? How did, how'd you do that, Joseph? How did you, like, what did you hear? Because when people hear God, they don't always hear it the same way. It comes a lot of different ways. Something happening inside of us. Some people see words and they're written out right in their brain. It's like they, they can read they're, they're in their brain. They're reading, and that's how they hear words. A lot of people don't. It's not like that. A lot of people see pictures. A lot of people just see something, and all of a sudden some, something that was nothing becomes something in their mind, and they start there like a thread, and they pull it. And as they pull it, uh, something emerges. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And he gave him this advice. And, every, and he says, and Pharaoh and the people that are there say, you know what, that's really great advice. And I believe Pharaoh stuns them all. And he said, could we find anybody better to do that job than this guy right here? And everything has changed. And Joseph has to process all that. He has two more sons. Two sons are born to, to him. Before the years of, of the famine came, so in that seven-year period, the next seven years, one's Manasseh. God has made me forget. Has God made you forget all the bad stuff yet? It's a good question. I think it's a fair question. Has God made you forget? Because if he hasn't, that's something that's good for you. That could be great. But he can do that. You can't do that. You can't slap yourself. You can't drink, drink some juice. You can't just do something and say, I will forget, I will forget, I will forget. But something about how, how the blessing begins to come back in your life, the blessing begins to flow, fills up the hole that that awful thing has lived in for a while. Maybe for, t for too long for most of us, if not all of us. Something that comes to make maybe perhaps the nightmare stop. Something that comes to bring comfort to the weeping that I had a vision and the vision died. And I don't know what to do with it. I thought this was the plan and it's not the plan. It doesn't appear to be. I don't understand what's going on. And then realize I am blessed. I am helped. God's, God hasn't forgotten me. So he names him Manasseh, pretty great name. But then there's maybe in some ways, maybe you, could, you would like this name. I really like this name. The second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land. And, and I think that's really great. Because now, his life's overflowing. I'm, 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 I'm full. How you doing, Joseph? I'm full. I'm full. I'm blessed. He doesn't say exactly what he's thinking about, what he remembers about his family, how he reflects on his family. It doesn't tell us that. We don't know. I don't know. But I know he's living this life, and he's enjoying his life, and he's blessed in his life, and he's fruitful in that life. He's a man of integrity. He's trusted, 
And he's not violating that trust. It's pretty great. But it's going to get better. A lot better. Well, another couple years go by, and there's famine in the land, finally. 22 years later, after Joseph is sold into slavery. And Jacob, his dad, is hungry. And they're in famine, just like Egypt is. He sends his ten brothers to go down to Egypt and buy a grain. But he holds Benjamin back. Benjamin is Joseph's brother by the same mother. Three other women, three other wives, kids by all those women. I, I don't think you can imagine that being a really great, like, cohesive, <laughs> cohesive, loving, warm environment. <laughs> Everybody's changing everybody else's diapers, whatever. You know, it's all, they're all great. I don't think it's exactly that great. And Joseph is the governor ruling under Pharaoh and everybody's accepted. He's very powerful. And his brothers came and bowed down before him and he remembers the dream. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Until you're in heaven, I don't know what your visions are or visions aren't. I don't know what your hopes are and your dreams are or dreams aren't. But until you get to heaven, a bunch of them he is able to raise from the dead when you think they're dead. I don't know when it will happen, when it will happen, how it will happen, how it will happen, but I know this. this is, there's not a man plan that could make this happen. And he looks at them. And he says, you are spies. No, my Lord. We are honest men. Can just say, hmm. If you're Joseph, hmm. <laughs> Let me check that. <laughs> Let me check. <laughs> Let's see. And they said, one is no more. Hmm. Hmm. I know a guy. In the mirror. So he winds up kind of having this thing with them. They don't understand what's going on. They don't recognize him. He puts them in a prison for a few days, and then he says to them, God's speaking to them apparently, do this and live, for I fear God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined here. Go and carry grain. I want to verify the story that you're telling me. I want to know. I want to know. If your brother is well, if you take care of him like you took care of me, maybe, something like that. And if dad is well, if you're actually even honest and, co and properly connected to him, because maybe you're not. And as they talk, he weeps. His heart's moving. I don't know if, what the process is exactly, but there's a transformation becoming manifest. He goes home, they tell dad, when they need more food, dad says, go get more food. And they says, dad, he told us specifically, do not come without your younger brother. Do not. What'd you tell him that for? <laughs> how, would, how would we know that if we said we have a younger brother, he would say, bring him here? How would we know that? We couldn't know that. But Judah, I believe Judah has gone through a radical transformation. And Judah says, now, and Judah says, send him with me and I will be his guarantee. I will take his place. If anything has happened, I will step in. I will give my life for him. Reuben offered a plan too. Reuben said, kill my two kids if I don't bring them back. I don't think that was a great plan. <laughs> like, you want me to kill, I, so my son doesn't come back, you want me to kill two of my grandkids. I don't like that plan. So why is Reuben the fr firstborn, not the leader of the family? I, I, think there's, I think there's some reasons for that. But I think right in this is where Judah begins to ascend to that place. It's manifest. He is a leader in this family. But he's gone through a terrible thing too. He was, apart from the family, many historians believe for 20 years, most of the time Joseph has been gone, has been away from the family. Judah was separated. 
living in, apart from his family. But apparently he came back and apparently he's apart now. So they come back. They, they uh, come again. They've brought back uh, more silver. They've given back the silver that was in their sacks and said somehow this was in our sacks. We said we were buying it, but our money was with, still with us and we're giving it back. Etc. But he has, and as he lets them go and he meets with them, has dinner with them, drinks with them, they have, they make merry together. He's got one more thing he's going to do. He plants his cup, his own personal silver cup, in the youngest sack. And when they find it, and, and so, and then off they go. They don't know that's with them. Off they go back to Jacob. And pretty quickly, Joseph sends his servants and says, go and look through their stuff. And if you find my cup there, bring them back. The person who's got the cup, he knows who it is. It's Benjamin, his brother. That person is going to stay here. And so they do it. And Judah begins to explain it to him and tells him, said, let me tell you about my dad. He doesn't know he's talking to Joseph. He said, let me tell you about my father. He's, an, he's a very old man and he's fragile. And he loves Benjamin. Now, I don't fully understand how, ben, how Judah's able to do this well, except his heart having been changed. How he's able to say, this is the reality of my family. It's not perfect. My family is kind of messed up in some ways. But that's my dad. That's still my dad. And before I left my dad, before we left, he didn't want to send him. And I told him, I would take his place, so I'm ready to take his place. Now, Jesus, when Jesus comes along, 15, 1600 years later, is not born from the tribe of Joseph, not from Manasseh, not from Ephraim. He's born from Judah. God's plan, bigger plan than Joseph. Joseph has a great plan, but the plan's bigger than Joseph, bigger than Joseph can see. And then he reveals himself to them. And they are horrified. I'm your brother Joseph. He, he, he tells them what's what and everything like that. And they cry together and dad still doesn't know the 22 year secret. So he tells them, you know, go, go tell dad your son Joseph is alive, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, and if we tell him that, we got to tell him the rest of the story, right? We got to tell him that. How? Well, how did Joseph get there? Uh, well, see, Dad, it's a long story. Do you remember what you went through with your in-laws? Do you remember that? Well, apparently it's in the family. We got problems in this family. So I want to tell you, I, I want to ask, um, uh, Dean, I mentioned that to you. Would you, would you, would you come do that right now? So, so this is just a quick testimony of forgiveness. That um, you know, so I've been saved uh, since I was in the process of being saved since I was 14, 15 years old. So uh, about 25 years ago, my wife and I ended up in an argument, and uh, I accused her of doing something that she didn't do. I thought she was uh, out of line with another man. And as I began to think about that and dwell on that, I got angrier and angrier and more jealous and more jealous. And then I felt something just take over, like a, uh, an acceleration of those feelings just went from 2 to 10. And for about four hours, I was extremely jealous, angry, mad, hurtful towards her. 
And about four hours later, when I finally came to my senses and I repented, I said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I felt something lift off of me, and it was gone. The, the bitterness and the anger left. Amen. So, I remember taking a, I, I was on, we were on our way to a minister's meeting, and it was, let's just say in, our, in mine and Cheryl's history, there have been, we've had some challenges in our lives as well staying at peace and keeping at peace with each other and thinking right. And, <clears throat> and I was struggling with, in the season that we were in, she was dealing with anger and I didn't think I could deal with it anymore. And I, in the car, not a great plan, in the car, I looked at her and I said, I have tried and tried to forget the things that you've said and done, and I cannot do it. I didn't know what I expected her to do with that. That just was consuming me. And she looked at me and she said, I've tried and tried to forget the things you've said and done, and I can't do it. I... I had to pull the car over. I had to go down a little side street and pull over. Nobody around, and we just both started crying. <laughs> Still remember it. But my life changed that day radically, radically. And for a few reasons, I don't fully understand it all, but I, but I know this. At that moment, I saw the price I was going to pay for not forgiving. And it was steep. I knew, like, I think, God knows what he could have done or not done, but I think it would not have been, it would be highly unlikely that Pastor Josh would be Pastor Josh today if I'd made a different choice that day pretty serious stuff. I had no idea the ramifications, where my life is going. But when we say we gave it to God, did you or not? Did you give your life to him? And if you did, is it his or not? So I remember in that moment, I thought, I thought, wow. Because it's, it, it it just, at that moment, it hit me. We have no place to go in this relationship. We are right up against the wall. And, uh, and it occurred to me for the first time, is it over? And I thought, God, I believe that's the last thing I ever wanted to do to my kids. That's the last thing. And I didn't know what, what would be next, but I said, I didn't know it would cost that much. And I said, I can forgive. And I can forget it. Because it's too expensive to keep it. So here's the point. If, if Holy Spirit has been leading me, and I think he has, some of us have forgiveness issues. Joseph, Joseph, here's, here's some things Joseph doesn't see. He can't see. Joseph doesn't know that from him will come significant people, Elkanah, Samuel, Joshua, Gideon, he doesn't know that from his brother Benjamin will come Esther, and she'll be needed. That all that's in this, this family that he's saving, this family that God has led him to save, is being saved for far more than his leadership.
God's seeing 400 years down the road, 500 years down the road, 1,000 years down the road, 15, 1,600 years down the road when Jesus comes to Judah and his clan. He's seeing the whole thing. You don't see the whole thing. When he asks you or leads you or tells you to forgive, he tells you to forgive because it's part of his plan. You're his. I'm his. We belong to him. He doesn't see that Samson will come from Dan. Jonah will come from Zebulon. Elijah will come from Gad. Moses and Miriam will come from Levi. Hosea will come from Issachar. Amos will come from Asher. He doesn't know that, he doesn't know that there's a plan for all these brothers and all their seed and all the stuff. Can we embrace Him, Jesus, Holy Spirit, in those deep things? The brothers had a secret they were trying to hide for 22 years. That was not God's plan. If you're hiding, Think about it. Think about it. Holy Spirit. Let's take the elements together. Let's receive. I don't know if you are, if you're dealing with a forgiveness issue, but if you are, let's get on God's side of this thing. And go with God and go with his plan. In Jesus' name. His body was broken. We understand, I believe, what that means. Holy Spirit, voice of God, is there anyone we need to forgive, I need to forgive? Do I need to forgive myself and cancel the curses I still believe exist over me? In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, cause us and help us to do relationships the way you do. Cause us and help us to not have cold hearts, lukewarm hearts. Cause us and help us you paid for sons and daughters. You didn't pay for less than that. You paid for sons and daughters. You paid for sons and daughters to be one with you. Like you. Is our love not like yours? God, I'm still, I still have to say my love is still not like yours. So change me. Change me. Thank you for the trials. Thank you for the troubles. Thank you, God, that in them, I don't enjoy them, I don't like them, but in them, there's opportunity, great opportunity for my heart to open. Great opportunity for me to see what's really in my heart. So God, help me. Help us. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who, who are indebted, who trespass, who sinned against us. You're the standard as we partake of this, these elements. Holy Spirit, help us. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. Stand with me, please. He said this cup is the new covenant. The gospel is yours. The gospel, as Isaiah 61, is ours. As 61 declares it, 
desperate people, he loves them. God, may that love flow through us. May we be full recipients and full sharers. May we prove to be and show to be and live to be your priests, your ambassadors, your sons, your daughters, representing you as we go home, representing you. As we interact leaving this building, we represent you. Make us receivers and givers because in this new covenant, you've established us as your righteousness being clothed in you, your righteousness, and that it would be right for us to represent you, that that's what we live for. Thank you, God. Let's partake. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I bless my brothers and my sisters. If you've got something that you want to get rid of today, if you've got bitterness in you and you're ready to get rid of it, if you've got unforgiveness and you're ready to get rid of it, you want to get rid of it, God wants you to get rid of it, please come. Please pray with someone today. Please pray with me or someone here today. Please pray. Please. God pleading with you. You don't see the picture. You don't see the plan. You don't know why it's important. But Holy Spirit just nudging the still small voice of God saying this is holding you back. It's not helping you. It's hurting you. Let God have his way. Lord, I affirm that there is one Lord and one Lord only, one faith, one faith only, one name above every name, Jesus, Yeshua, one God, Yahweh, above all gods, if there, if there are any other gods, none like you, all-powerful, wonderful, We're here for you. Be glorified in us, in our homes, our families, our challenges. I speak life in Jesus' name, life into broken souls and broken bodies. Come back to full life, abundant life in Jesus' name. Anyone that wants prayer, please come. <laughs>